So let's jump in. We when we when we talk our stacking up show, we generally we talk about the rush offense defense. We talk about pass offense defense, and we talk about total right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start with the rush, and we're going to start with what? Well, based on the rankings of last year, that both teams were the best at when we're talking about mm-hmm. this side of the football. So Notre Dame's rush defense, sixteenth in the country. Florida State's rush offense. 31st in the country, which Mm -hmm. I will admit when I looked that up uh, this afternoon, I was a little bit surprised uh, by that fact that they they averaged one-tenth of a yard under 200 yards a game on the ground. Uh, Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing to think about, Vince. 31st in the the nation with 199.9 yards per game. Look at where they rank, however, in tackles for loss allowed. Imagine what their run game would look like if they didn't right. rank 104th in tackles for loss a lot. Now, part of that is, and, and we'll, we'll show this here real quick. Let's just kind of look ahead real fast. Oh, sacks allowed. They ranked yeah. 112th. Right, right. So that was part of it too. But even if you look at the tackles for loss, they gave up 29 sacks, and again, they only played nine games last year. That means mm-hmm. they gave up what 37 tackles for loss. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. Uh, that's a lot to give up, and that comes from being a young, inexperienced offensive line. They're a massive offensive line, so when they played right, they could push people. That's the, a thing about them. When you look at their depth chart, Vince, you know, left to right, their offensive line is 312, 321, 280, 323, and 294. They got some athletic, some big dudes on there. And, and so when you look at it, you say, okay, they had success running the ball. Where would that come from? Where where'd that success come from? And when you break Florida State down last year, you look at a couple things, as we talked about before. One of the better uh, running back groups they're going to have. Deshaun Corbin, transfer from Texas A&M, played for them last year. He ran for a 401 yards. Uh, Lawrence Toffoli average, ran for 356 yards and averaged 9.6 yards per carry. And their quarterback, Jordan Travis, ran for 559 yards a game. He led them in rushing last yeah. year, 5.8 yards per carry. Think about that when you also consider how many times he was sacked. Yeah. Sacks in college count towards your run game. Which is ridiculous, but that's a whole other right. show. So, that's a so, whole other conversation. Yeah. So when you think about that, they had a quarterback that was sacked a lot who still averaged 5.8 yards per carry. That's that's where you want to know why they're good in a run game. It's they got talent and they got a, a quarterback that can run. Yeah. You look at the two backs. You look at uh, Jashawn Corbin is a is a, a a physical runner. I wouldn't call him like a bulldozer or anything, like that, but he runs hard. He's a lot like Sebo Flemister. He doesn't look like he'd be a guy that's a physical runner. He's not like he's not doesn't look like Audric Estime, for example. But he runs hard. He makes good reads. He's a slasher. You know, a, a physical guy. One cut, get downhill, hit people. And, you know, doesn't have great speed, but he's a quick, he's a good athlete. He's just not like, he's more Dexter Williams than he is Chris Tyree. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so he's a good back. Then you bring Lawrence Tofili in there. He's, you know, 6'1", 6'2". He can catch the ball. He's a home run hitter. You know, he averaged last year over nine yards a carry. You know, it was very similar to kind of what De- the numbers Dexter Williams put up. If you remember back in 2017, Vince, when, when Dexter Williams ran for, what was it like? You know, three hundred some yards, but he averaged over nine yards a carry because he didn't carry much. But when he did, it was a big play. Yeah, yeah. and that's kind of what it was. It was, it was. You know, they're not built like thunder and lightning, but like production wise, they're thunder and lightning. Right, right. Same effect. Yeah. yeah. Deshaun Corbin's at five yards a carry. Hammer. You know, you look at Lawrence Tofili, who you know there was a game where he had zero carries, a game where he had three carries for one yard against another name, three carries for one yard. Although he did catch a pass for thirty-one yards, no carries against Carolina, didn't play against NC State, one carry for minus one yard against Pitt. But then there's you know eight carries for sixty-four yards at Miami. Remember, Miami had two DNs get drafted in the first round last year. He had twelve carries for ninety-nine yards against Jacksonville State, and then he ended the season against Duke with seven carries for one hundred seventeen yards. Yeah, that'll help. You know, and then you look at how they played in that game against Duke. Now, again, Duke was terrible, but <clears throat> Jashawn Corbin ran for 72 yards. Lawrence Tefili ran for 72 yards. You know, and then you start looking at it and you say, boy, they, they had some guys that could do some damage, you know. And then Jordan Travis ran for 90 yards in that matchup. So there's some weapons in the run game to work with there. The question for them is going to be twofold. Number one, 
can the offensive line eliminate the mistakes that resulted in in those just drive killing tackles for loss? First and ten, you're minus four. Right. Is that's that's a big part of it? And then can they can they be a, you know, and that's where you come get down to the efficiency part? Can the offensive line play to that level? The second part we'll get into in a minute, and that is can the pass game provide them with some protection? Because right. That's the other part that's impressive about their run performance last year. Is nobody was afraid of Florida State throwing a ball on them last year, especially when Jordan Travis was a quarterback. Well, they were they were they were one dimensional. I mean, right. and, and and I mean that in the strictest sense of the word. No, nobody right. was worried about. I mean, we talk about teams packing the box against Notre Dame because they weren't worried about the pass game. Right. No, Notre Dame's pass game it was, was a Hall of Fame pass game in comparison to what yeah. Florida State did last yeah. year. Right. I well, mean, in the it, game where they upset North Carolina, Vince, their 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 pass, their quarterbacks went eight of nineteen for 191 yards and one touchdown. They had like one couple long plays. They went eight of nineteen and went on the road or at home, beat a te- team at the time was top five. They right. weren't a real top five team. They were partly top five because some teams weren't even playing yet. Yeah, right. Uh, but you know, still they went on the road, beat a team that everybody thinks is going to be a top 10, 10 team this year, beat them, and their quarterback completed eight passes. Yeah. Right, exactly. You but know? now Jordan Travis was a threat with his legs, and you've yeah. already established that. And that's yeah. that's really how he hurt Notre right. Dame. Uh, you know, when when Notre Dame w- was hurt by their offense, right. right? It was by him using his legs, right? Um, and so he's a threat if he if he's going to be the quarterback. And see that, that that's the other thing we don't even know who the quarterback is going to be. But this we're talking about the rush offense for Florida State. If Jordan Travis is the quarterback, that makes this an even deeper yeah. run game than if it's McKenzie Milton right quarterback so let's let's look at last year events when you look yeah. at Notre Dame I'm gonna take the Florida State game out here's what Notre Dame did on the ground last year with their rush defense this is yards allowed 76 106 96 44 88 34 to Clemson 85 and 87 that took them into the Syracuse game they gave up 229 against Syracuse we talked about that they had like an 80 yard run late they didn't right. wasn't that good of a game they had a lot of right junk. I remember that right route, that play yeah so in, in between that the the opener against Duke and the in the game against North Carolina Notre Dame gave up over 106 yards one time that was the Florida State they gave up 153 yards uh to Florida to Florida State in that game well then then you look at it and say okay well well, well Notre Dame had uh, four sacks for minus 22 yards. So you add 22 yards onto that, that that 175 gained like rushing yards. You take yeah. the sacks away. So they had some success. And as you said, a lot of that was Jordan Travis running around. That's not going to change if he's the quarterback this year. Right, absolutely. And, and this is where we're going to learn something about the Marcus Freeman defense. What was the kryptonite to Clark Lee in recent years? Mobile quarterbacks. It was mobile quarterbacks. Absolutely. It, it going, I mean – I mean, even in really to a degree, and during even during Mike Elko's tenure, yeah. if you go back all the way to 2017, yeah. Vince, it's been an issue for a while. I yeah, mean, it's become yeah. it's become a go to phrase yeah. for people in the media because it's a real thing. Right, but like the the mobile quarterback is a problem yeah. for Notre Dame, et cetera. Well, it's et cetera. a problem for a lot of people, but it, right. it has been you, even going back to 2017. You had. You had a quarterback at Wake Forest. They, you know, you had you had Malik Rozier had some scrambles against Notre Dame that year, 2018. You know, th- they didn't play a whole lot of mobile quarterbacks that year. Yeah, uh, and that was and that was a that was a great defense, right? First mobile quarterback they really played that year, if you want to be honest about it, other than uh, than Malcolm Perry at Navy, uh, who doesn't really count, but <laughs> they yeah, you know they knocked count. Eric Eric. Um, Eric Dungey was a mobile quarterback. They knocked him out in the first quarter against Syracuse, if you remember that. That's right. Yeah. There weren't a whole lot of other mobile quarterbacks on the schedule that year. And then they played Trevor Lawrence, and his mobility was a problem for Notre Dame. Right. And you fast forward to 2019, they had issues with Jawan Pass at Louisville, if you remember that that year. I do. The first half against Virginia, Bryce Perkins gave them a lot of problems. It wasn't until the second half that they just unleashed hell on that yeah. Virginia offensive line. That was ugly. But Virginia was moving a ball on Notre Dame early. You know, Shea Patterson had some scrambles for chain moving plays and big plays in that that wet game. Uh, Virginia Tech didn't really have much of a mobile quarterback. The rest of the schedule didn't have much of a mobile quarterback. And guess what? Notre Dame shut all those teams down. Right. Uh, so, you know, that that's the kind of thing that you look at, Vince, and say that. And then, of course, Jordan Travis last year. I mean, this was a this was a 35-26 game in the second half, Vince. 
you know, Florida State had a lead at one point in time in that game. Now, part of that was, again, Notre Dame turning the ball over a bunch. Sure. But when you look at the run game, Vince, that's the part that's going to make this interesting. And then you look at against a Notre Dame defensive line that's undersized relative to Florida State, a defensive line or a front seven that's you know missing its anticipated will linebacker. I have projected, and I think you agree with me, correct me if I'm wrong, we that I believe that the run defense will won't miss a beat with JD Bertrand compared to Maris Lufout. We're gonna find out in game one if that's yes, true. Yes, we not. will. Yes, we will. Because uh, that's it, gonna that, yeah, that's gonna be their crutch. Yeah. It's gonna be their run game. Because they, right. they know right. they can do that. Right. I mean that yeah, well, look, when you're calling plays, Brian, when you were an offensive court or you know, when you were a, 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 you know, the run game coordinator, pass game coordinator, whatever, and you're calling plays. You lean on what you're good at, right? You you right. lean on what if you you're know good. you if can you're any do. Good at what you do, yeah. yes, correct. Well, fair enough. Um, <laughs> fair that enough. wasn't a that wasn't a pushback, Vince. That was an add-on. No, no, no. Yes, what you're saying. Like, yes. yes, If you're but good if, at what you do, yes, that's exactly what you do. Right. You lean on what you're good at, and this is the first game of the season. So the last mm-hmm. time these guys were on the field, they were good at running the football. So mm-hmm. guess what? They're gonna run the football, and so. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, a lot of this comes down to who the quarterback is. And obviously we're going to talk about that when we get into the pass game stuff. But when we're talking about the run game, if it's Jordan Travis, he's going to be involved in the run game. Right. He, and so Notre Dame. Well, and Mackenzie Milton. And, and then the flip side is if it's Mackenzie Milton, he's playing to his potential. He's going to give them more of a pass game threat, which then right. protects the run game. So either yeah. way, right. the it's quarterback is going to impact yeah. the run game. Yes. Right. No question. No question. Right. It's, just, it's just a kind of a different way to prepare, though. Right. Because Mackenzie Milton is a pocket passer. He's not, right. especially coming off of his injury. Uh, well, he, he is. I'm saying, we, we think he is now. Yes. Yes. Correct. That's, that's what I was he referring to. He definitely wasn't that at UCF. But yes, right. uh, with that, I mean, kid lost over two years of football. Right. He's not going to look like the guy he was at UCF. And and if I'm his coach, I don't want him running around like especially a Especially in the person. opener. Yeah. Especially in the opener. <laughs> and then, Vince, what are some of the questions that we have? And this isn't questions about the defense in regards to we're worried about them being bad, but they're just questions that we have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how's MTA going to handle being a big end, right? We've seen him in practice. Now we get to see him in, in a game. You know, are, are Adam Yola and Riley Mills going to be as good as we thought they're going to be? All right. How's Foskey going to be now as a starter? You know, you've got the Will linebacker situation with Louisville being out and J.D. Bertrand, who's never really played any high leverage snaps during his career. You know, he's been mostly special teams guy. Drew White, does he bounce back and right. play better than he did last year? Jeremiah Wusukormo made some huge plays against Florida State last year. If you remember that one play where they ran a pl- pitch play and he just came out and just crushed that running back. How's Jack Kaiser and, and those Rovers going to do playing that role? So there are – there's a lot we're going to learn – Oh about yeah, this Notre Dame offense or this Notre Dame defense in the opener, in my opinion, and and it's going to be on all levels of the defense, and yes. that's what makes this matchup very very intriguing. Oh, it absolutely is, and it, it's those question marks that we think we may have answers to, at least in my head. Uh, but at the same time, we need to see it. And, and that's what I mean when I say questions. Yeah, it's just like, right. hey, we think that this is going to be good. Right. But now it's time to, okay, it's it's put up or shut up time now. Because, look, Notre Dame's been going against Notre Dame, you know, all, all through camp and, and what we've seen. And and we think that the, the front seven is going to be able to get after it in the run game. Well, mm-hmm. this is a great first test to see if that's the right. case. Uh, so we're, we're going to see if when the rubber meets the road, if they can actually put up or shut up. So uh, another uh, interesting part about this too, Vince, is I forgot to mention, and I, 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 I should have mentioned it, but also one of their starting offensive linemen at left guard is going to be Dylan Gibbons, the Notre Dame yeah, transfer. Right. Of course. Well, obviously he start he came in and played left guard last year for Notre Dame in this game when Liam Eikenberg went out, they bumped Aaron Banks out to left tackle. Dylan right. Gibbons came in. He was in the game for a couple of those long runs. So, um, I, We'll see how he performs, you right. know, in this game. So it, it, it's going to be an intriguing matchup, no question about it. And they, they've got him at right guard. Is that accurate? It's what uh, the, I thought it was left guard. Is, okay, yeah. So so the, the 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 depth chart that they released. So we record. We're recording this show on Monday night. Uh, they released their depth chart today. Okay, he was at left guard. Okay. Uh, so so that was. And here's another thing too about this: a couple guys that were starters for them last year for a chunk of the season got beat out in fall camp on the offensive line too. So that's another sign if you're Florida State. You know, Dante Lucas was a starter at times last year. Uh, Baby on Johnson started some games for them last year. Those are two veteran guys. Johnson's a redshirt senior. Lucas is a redshirt sophomore, meaning he's at least a third-year player. Those guys are on the bench. 
yeah, because of some of these younger guys. So you, you have to think that the coaching staff believes they're putting a more talented group of blockers on the field. That's going to be the intriguing matchup. And, and if the Notre Dame defensive line is as good as we think it's going to be, it's going to have to show up in this part of the game. Yes, no question. So advantage time. Notre Dame run uh, rush defense versus Florida State's rush offense. Who you got? I was very close to going even on this one, Vince, but I'm going to give a slight edge to Notre Dame because I I do think this is a a talented group, and if Jordan Travis is a quarterback, that makes me want to go even. Uh, Yes. But that's still an old situation. I think Notre Dame has the edge along the lines. Florida State has some some issues, has some skill that could give Notre Dame some props. I'm going to lean towards Notre Dame advantage. But I think it's going to be a lot closer than some people think because this is going to be one of the better running teams Notre Dame faces all year. That number right there to, to the, you know, that thirty first ranking, Vince, that wasn't a fluke. Yeah, that was. It, it's not like they went and had a game last year where they, you know, they, the Jacksonville State. You saw they ran for two sixty three against Jacksonville State. They ran for one fifty one against Miami, one fifty three against Notre Dame, two forty one against Carolina, two sixty five against Louisville, three twenty four against Duke. I'm sorry. That yeah yeah so that's that's what they did so I mean that's that's good work yeah that's good work by Florida State no question about it so I am also going to go with Notre Dame I I've just seen so too much in person at practice the athleticism the quickness off the ball all mm-hmm. of that from this front uh, for Notre Dame uh, you know Jason Adamiola Riley Mills MTA you know just that whole group seeing what they've been doing at practice with my own two eyes. I I can't I can't go with Florida State. I ha, I mm-hmm. I have a lot of faith in what this front is going to do. And then you add in Marcus Freeman to kind of activate mm-hmm. these linebackers and and what mm-hmm. they're going to be able to do. Um, especially JD Bertrand. To be honest with you, I, I'm I'm very interested to see what they do with him in the run game because I think he can be v- a very active player in the run game. And I, I just I want to see what Marcus Freeman does when he activates that group. So I'm taking Notre Dame. I think I'm a little bit more confident than you are, but again, it if it, if Mackenzie Milton is the quarterback, I'm super confident in the run defense. Super confident. If yeah. it's if it's Jordan Travis, I it, it comes back it comes back a little bit, right? Because of that mobile quarterback situation mm-hmm. and all all everything we just talked about, it does come back for me, but it's still going to be an advantage to Notre Dame. And, and one last thing that, that that I think plays in Notre Dame's favor, too, is the Florida State people have been making a lot of the fact that Mike Norvell has faced Marcus Freeman a lot. Mike Norvell had a lot of success against the Cincinnati defense when he was at, 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 Memphis. at, at Memphis. That was early in the Cincinnati tenure. They were replacing a fired coaching staff. Right. Uh, and, and it took them a while. He didn't face the 2019 and 2020 versions of Florida State. You, you know what I mean? Or, or Cincinnati. Oh, Cincinnati. So, Right. Correct. And, and well, Notre Dame's talent level wasn't there either, and that makes a difference. Right. Well, he did face the 2019 version. They didn't face the the 2018 Memphis team that beat Cincinnati twice in back to back games. I believe, or was that 2019? I'm trying. I always get this. Yeah. So 2019, they beat uh, Memphis. Beat Cincinnati back to back games, and it was one in the end of the regular season, then one in the the the. The championship AAC title game. Yeah. Right. And they had success running the ball on Cincinnati in both of those games. Okay. It wasn't until 2020 that the Cincinnati defense really took off. So those are the things you have to look at and say, okay, what are they going to be like? Well, in 2020, Cincinnati held Memphis to five yards rushing. Well, Mike Norvell wasn't there anymore. Right. So those are the things you look at and say, oh, okay, advantage who? Well, to me, it's advantage Memphis. Because if you look at those those matchups, Memphis had they were deeper into Mike Norvell's tenure. He took over sure. for a coach who had success, Justin Fuente. Did a great job, got the Virginia Tech job. So they were further along. Well, now it's Marcus Freeman that has the advantage in talent. Right. Absolutely, it's Mark, you know, and 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 those type of things. So that's going to be really interesting. I think that is something that plays a little bit into Marcus Freeman's favor. Even though Mike Norvell got the edge on him in their matchups in the AAC. I think that's going to benefit Marcus Freeman more than it's going to benefit Mike Norvell. 